Hello everyone, I'm Professor Trouble Wei and uh, I have posted the results of the examination uh, on uh, May 26 on the on our course website. You can go to the course website to see your uh, scores. And uh, we still use remote teaching and uh, in each week we have a quiz which starts from Monday 8.30 a.m via the cyber university and uh, there will be uh, and the final exam examination will be held on June 22nd the time is from uh, 9 to 10 a.m. to 11 10 a.m. the scope will cover section 5.1 up to section uh, 5.6 uh, more detailed information will be posted on the course website later. In this week, we are going to learn section 5.3, least squares problems, and uh, we will also cover uh, part of the results in section 5.5. Uh, in the next week, we will finish uh, section 5.5 and section 5.6. In this slide, I present the motivation for this squares problems. Uh, consider a linear equation ax equals b. Then this system is uh, either consistent or not consistent. If the linear equation is consistent, then it has it then it either has exactly one solution or has infinitely many solutions but if the linear equation is not consistent consistent then what can we do for example for an overdetermined linear system uh, which means uh, it has more equations uh, which means the number of, of equations is more than the number of unknowns and uh, such system is usually inconsistent. What can we do for uh, an inconsistent uh, linear equation? Uh, for such a system, uh, we usually uh, search an uh, approximate solution of the linear system. By solving the least squares problems, uh, we are able to obtain an approximate solution to the linear system. In this slide, we define the least squares problem. The goal of a least squares problem is to find a vector x such that ax is closest to b. Uh, for example, suppose B is not in the column space of A, and our goal is to find some x hat uh, such that A x hat, uh, such that the distance between A x hat and uh, B is uh, as small as possible. In other words, our goal is to solve the following minimization problem. Our goal is to find some x such that the norm of b minus ax is uh, as small as possible. Uh, let, uh, we define rx uh, as b minus ax and uh, we can regard rx as the, uh, as the approximation error and uh, we want the norm of the approximation error is as small as possible. And uh, we called uh, this minimization problem as the least squares problem. A vector x hat that uh, accomplish this task is called a least squares solution. And uh, we defined uh, P as ax hat. Then P is a vector in the column space of A that is closest, closest to B. 
the vector P is also called the projection of B onto the column space of A. Next, we introduce theorem 5.3.1. Uh, this theorem has two parts. The first part is that let S be a subspace of Rn. Then for each B in Rm, there is a unique element P of S that is closest to B. That is, uh, for any Y in S and the Y is not equal to P, then the known of the norm of B minus Y is greater than the norm of B minus P. The second part is that uh, given a vector P in S, P will be closest to a given vector B in Rm if and only if B minus P belongs to S perp. We can use the right hand side figure to visualize theorem 5.3.1. Uh, let B be a given vector and uh, uh, P is the projection of, of B onto S. Then B minus P is orthogonal to S and hence B minus P is uh, and hence B minus P belongs to S perp. If now we, we can pick another vector y in S, suppose y is not equal to P, then the, then the norm of B minus y is always greater than the norm of B minus P. We prove the first part of theorem 5.3.1, uh, that is uh, for any B in Rm, we want to find an element P in S such that the following, such that the following uh, inequality is satisfied for any Y in S and the Y is not equal to P. And recall that Rm is the direct sum of S and the S perp. And uh, by the definition of uh, the direct sum, we know if B is in Rm, then B can be uniquely expressed as the sum of P and Z, where P belongs to S and Z belongs to S perp. Now if Y is another element in S, then the norm of B minus Y equals the norm of B minus P plus P minus y. We know that b minus p belongs to s perp because b minus p equals z and z belongs to s perp. So b minus p belongs to s perp. And uh, we also have p minus y belongs to s because s is a subspace and uh, p and y are both in s. So, uh, because the vector addition is closed in a subspace, hence P minus Y is in S. Since B minus P is in S perp and uh, P minus Y is in S, we know B minus P is orthogonal to P minus Y. And uh, by the Pythagorean law, we know uh, the square of the norm of B minus y equals the square of the norm of b minus p plus the square of the norm of p minus y. And since p is not equal to y, hence the, uh, the less known p minus y is always greater than zero. And hence we know uh, the norm of b minus y is always greater than the norm of b minus p. And uh, so far, we have find an element P in S that is closest to B. And uh, we have finished the proof of the first part of theorem 5.3.1. From the above 
uh, derivation, we know that uh, if p is if p belongs to S and uh, b minus p belongs to S perp, then p is the element in S that is clo closest to b. And uh, this statement is the uh, if part of the second part of theorem 5.3.1. Next, we prove the second part of theorem 5.3.1. We only prove the only if part because the if part has been proved in the previous slide. Uh, that is, we want to prove suppose uh, P in S is closest to a given vector B in Rn. Then B minus P must belong to S perp. We will prove by contradiction. That is, uh, we suppose B minus P does not belong to S perp, and uh, we will we will show uh, that we will uh, arrive at a contradiction. Now suppose P is the element in S that is closest to B. Then. Uh, and uh, we know B can be written as Q plus Z uh, for some Q in S and uh, some Z in S perp uh, because Rm is the direct sum of S and uh, S perp. Now suppose B minus P does not belong to S perp. Then this means Q is not equal to P because we know B minus Q equals Z, where Z belongs to S perp. Uh, therefore, B minus Q must belong to S perp. Since B minus P does not belong to S perp, then we know Q is not equal to P. Uh, next, know that the norm of B minus P equals the norm of B minus Q plus Q plus uh, Q minus P, and uh, know that B minus Q belongs to S perp, and uh, Q minus P belongs to S, because Q and P are both in S, and uh, S is a subspace, so Q minus P uh, belongs to S. And uh, since B minus Q is orthogonal to Q minus P, then by the Pythagorean law, we know uh, the norm of the square of the norm of B minus P equals the square of the norm of B minus Q plus uh, the square of the norm of Q minus P. Because Q is not equal to P, the norm of Q minus P is always greater than zero. Hence, we have uh, B the norm of B minus P is greater than the norm of uh, B minus Q, which is a contradiction because uh, we already have P is the element of S that is closest to B. And uh, this, this inequality suggests that uh, Q is the closest uh, element. Uh, Q is the element of S that is clo closest to B. Hence, we arrive at a contradiction. So uh, uh, our uh, assumption B uh, minus P does not belong to S perp is wrong, and therefore B minus P must belong to S perp. And the proof of the second part of theorem 5.3.1 is finished. Below we discuss two remarks regarding theorem 5.3.1. Re remark 1 states that if B belongs to S, then the projection vector P equals B. This remark is clear because if P is the projection vector of B onto S, then 
if b belongs to s then the projection vector p equals b uh, next we consider remark 2 and uh, we let s be the column space of a and uh, we use the right hand side figure to visualize theorem 5.3.1 let B be a vector in Rm, and P is the projection vector of B onto Ra. Since P is in Ra, uh, and uh, therefore P can be written as Ax hat for some x hat in Rn. Then from theorem 5.3.1, B minus P uh, must belong to S perp. Uh, which is the perp of uh, the column space of A. Then by the fundamental subspaces theorem, uh, the perp of Ra equals the null space of A transpose. Hence, uh, hence we know A transpose times B minus Ax hat equals the zero vector. Uh, that is, if P is the co closest element in Ra, then x hat must satisfy a transpose a x hat equals a transpose b. And uh, this equation is known as the normal equation. If p is the closest element in Ra, then x hat must satisfy the normal equation. And uh, we say uh, and uh, we said s hat is a solution of the least squares problem for ax equals b then x satisfy the normal equations next we discuss theorem 5.3.2 if a is a matrix of dimension m times n and uh, assume uh, rank a equals n then the normal equation uh, uh, have a unique solution s hat equals the inverse of a transpose a times a transpose b and uh, x hat is called the unique least square solution of the linear system ax equals b we know that uh, matrix a if matrix a uh, has rank n then we say a matrix A has four column rank because n is the number of columns of A. If A has four column rank, then uh, the normal equations have a unique solution. To prove this theorem, we suppose rank A equals n, and uh, first we will show A transpose A is non-singular. Uh, to to prove this, uh, we consider z vector z that satisfies a transpose a z equals the zero vector. From this equation, we know a z belongs to the null space of a transpose, and uh, we also have a z belongs to the column space of a. And uh, by the fundamental subspaces theorem. The column space of A equals the perp of the null space of A transpose. And hence, uh, AZ is in the intersection of uh, in the intersection of the null space of A transpose and uh, the perp of the null space of A transpose. Since the intersection of the two subspaces is the set containing only the zero vector and uh, hence az must be equal to the zero vector now we use the assumption rank a equals n which means the columns of a are linearly independent and therefore az uh, equals zero only has the trivial solution and uh, therefore z must equal to 
must be equal to the zero vector. And hence, the null space of A transpose A is the set containing only the zero vector. And therefore, A transpose A is non-singular. Then we can multiply the both sides of the normal equation with the inverse of A transpose A and obtain uh, and obtain x hat. And uh, in this case, the normal equation uh, has exactly one solution. And uh, x hat is the unique solution of the normal equations. Below are three remarks regarding the normal equations. Remark 1. If A does not have rank N, then what can we do? Uh, if A does not have four column rank, we can still use uh, elementary row operations to solve the normal equations. And uh, in this case, the normal equations have in infinitely many solutions. Remark 2. Uh, the projection vector P equals AX hat, uh, which, which also equals uh, A times the inverse of A transpose A times A transpose B. If we define the matrix P as A times the inverse of A transpose A times A transpose, then the matrix P is called the projection matrix. And uh, the projection vector P uh, equals the projection matrix times the vector B. And uh, know that the projection vector is the element of RA that is closest to B in the least square sense. We know that the projection matrix P is symmetric. That is P equals P transpose. And uh, this is left uh, for you as an exercise. And uh, the projection matrix also satisfy the following property. Uh, P square equals P. P square, P square is uh, P times P. And know that uh, A transpose A uh, ca cancels the inverse of A transpose A and therefore P square equals uh, A times the inverse of A transpose A uh, times A transpose uh, which equals P and therefore the projection matrix satisfies uh, P square equals P. The third remark is uh, the normal equations are always consistent because the range space of A transpose A equals the range space of A transpose. Uh, if this equality holds, then uh, we know uh, the vector A transpose B belongs to the column space of A transpose. And uh, because uh, R A transpose R A transpose A equals R A transpose, and hence, A transpose B uh, must belong to the column space of uh, A transpose A. And therefore, uh, the normal equations are always consistent. You can use exercise 13 of section 5.2 to prove the above equality. Um, from remark 3, we know uh, the normal equations are always consistent, which means the normal equation either has exactly one solution or uh, have infinitely many solutions. If matrix A has four column rank, then the normal equations uh, have exactly one solution. On the other hand, if matrix A does not have four column rank, then the normal equations have infinitely many solutions. Example 1 illustrates how to solve the 
least squares problem. Uh, consider the linear system. This linear system has three equations and uh, two variables. Uh, and uh, we can uh, rewrite the linear system as AX equals B, where A is a matrix of dimension 3 times 2, because the linear system has three equations and uh, two variables. And uh, our goal is to uh, find the least squares solution, which means to solve the normal equations for the linear system. The normal equation is obtained by pre-multiplying uh, the both sides of the linear equation by A transpose. Hence, we will so solve uh, the normal equation, uh, which is a transpose AX equals A transpose B. Because uh, A has four column rank, uh, that is rank A equals 2. And uh, hence, the normal equations uh, has a unique solution. And uh, you can use elementary uh, row operations, or you can compute the inverse of A transpose A to obtain the solution to the normal equation. In this slide, we illustrate how to use the least squares method to fit a polynomial of degree n, given a table of data, where x1, x2 up to xm are the input data, and y1, y2 up to ym are the corresponding outputs. And uh, our goal is to find a polynomial P of X uh, that fits the input output pairs. Here, uh, fits the input output pairs means uh, the polynomial P of X should satisfy the following constraints. Uh, P, of X, P of X1 should should be close to y1 and uh, p of x should be p of x2 should be close to y2 and so on uh, uh, p of xm should be close to ym and uh, that, that is our goal is to find uh, coefficients c, c0 c1 c2 up to cn such that such that the polynomial p of x of degree n that uh, such that the polynomial fits the input output pairs and uh, to this end we can write down uh, the following linear system this linear system has m equations and uh, n variables uh, the first equation in the linear system corresponds to uh, y1 equals p of x1. On the right hand side is y1 and uh, on the left hand side is p of x1 which can be written as c0 plus c1 x1 plus c2 x1 square plus up to cn times uh, the nth power of x1. And uh, the sec second equation in the linear system is y2 equals p of x2 and uh, on, on the right hand side is y2 on the left hand side is uh, p of x2 which is uh, c0 plus c1 x2 plus c2 uh, x2 square plus up to cn times the nth power of x2 and uh, we can uh, rewrite the linear system as uh, AX equals B, where X contains the coefficients of the polynomial, and uh, X is the uh, variable that we want to solve. And uh, vector B contains the uh, output data Y1, Y2 up to Ym. And the uh, matrix A contains uh, entries related to the input data x1, x2 up to xm. 
and uh, the linear system has m equations and uh, n variables. In general, the number of equations is greater than the number of variables, and uh, usually this linear system is inconsistent. So we will uh, attempt to find an approximate solution for this linear system. And, and uh, thus, we will use the least squared method to find an approximate solution for the linear system. And uh, this amounts to, fi to find the least squared solution to the linear system. Uh, that is, we will uh, solve the normal equation uh, for this linear system to obtain the least squared solution. Fitting a polynomial is uh, known as the polynomial regression in machine learning, which is a fundamental problem. x1, y1, x2, y2, up to xm, ym are also called uh, the training data. And uh, p of x can be regarded as uh, a prediction model. The goal of machine learning is to learn a model uh, that makes uh, correct predictions. Here, a model can make correct predictions means p of x1 should be close to y1 and uh, p of x2 should be close to y2 and so on. And uh, uh, to learn a model from the training data means to use some methods such as the least squares method to compute the model parameters c0, c1, c2 up to cn uh, based on the training data. Uh, once the learning process is complete, we obtain uh, the prediction model p of x. Then we can use the prediction model to make predictions on unseen input data. And uh, here, unseen input data means uh, uh, input data does are not in the set x1, x2, uh, up to xm. In example 3, we illustrate how to use the least squares method to fit a quadratic function to the training data. Uh, for a quadratic function, the highest degree is 2, and hence the parameters of a quadratic function are c0, c1, and c2. Our goal is to find a quadratic function p of x that best fits the data. And uh, our training data has four input output pairs. And, and uh, this amounts to solving uh, the following linear equation. And uh, because we have four input output pairs, so we will have four equations. And uh, we have three variables, c0, c1, c2, uh, because the a quadratic function uh, has three coefficients. Uh, on, the, on the right hand side of the linear equation, uh, is a vector b which is related to the output data y and uh, on the left hand side is a matrix a uh, matrix a is of dimension three uh, four times three and uh, the entries of uh, matrix a are related to input data x know that uh, matrix a has four column rank uh, that is uh, rank a equals its uh, number of columns. Because A has four column rank and uh, the and hence the least squares solution is unique. And uh, after solving the normal equations we will obtain the least square solutions C0, C1 and C2 which is unique. Uh, once C0, C1, C2 are determined we obtain the 
quadratic function p of x. The right hand side figure visualizes the uh, fitting results of example 3. The four blue points in the figure corresponds to the four input output pairs, and uh, the solid black curve uh, represents the quadratic function obtained by solving the least squares problem. And uh, we know that the least squares method aims at uh, minimizing the, diff the distance between y1 and uh, p of x1 and uh, uh, plus the distance between uh, y2 and the p of x2 and uh, plus the distance between the uh, the distance between y3 and the p of x3 plus the distance between uh, y4 and the p of x4 we know that the quadratic function may not pass through the four points and the uh, better fitting results can be obtained by increasing the highest order of the polynomial function however this might need lead to the problem of overfitting if you are interested in uh, polynomial regression you can refer to any machine learning textbook for for a more detailed discussion Next, we discuss application 3, which use the least squares method to fit a circle to data points. Given n sample pairs of coordinates x1, y1, x2, y2, up to xn, yn, our goal is to fit a circle to the n sample pairs. That is, we want to determine the center c1, c2, and uh, the radius r of a circle to fit the n sample pairs. To this end, we rewrite the circle equation as this one. And know that the variables to be solved are c1, c2, and r. Then we introduce a new variable, c3, to represent r squared minus c1 squared minus c2 squared and uh, the above uh, equation becomes uh, this one uh, then we can substitute uh, data points into the above equation and uh, obtain the following linear equation uh, suppose uh, this linear equation is uh, ax equals b and, and the x is the variable that we want to solve which uh, are c1, c2, and c3. And the vector b and the matrix x uh, contains entries uh, uh, which are related to the n sample pairs. We can use the uh, least squares method to uh, compute an approximate solution for the linear system. Once we obtain the least squares solution, we obtain C1, C2, and C3, where C1, C2 is the center of the circle. And uh, uh, from C3, C1, C2, we, we can obtain the radius R as the square root of C3 plus C1 square plus C2 square. The right hand side figure depicts the result depicts the fitting result uh, where the x dots are the n sample pairs and uh, the solid blue uh, curves represent uh, the circle uh, obtained by the least squares method we have finished section 5.3 and uh, we are going to introduce section 5.5 the orthonormal sets uh, recall that in section, uh, section 3.5, given a basis f in a vector space v, and suppose x is a vector in v, 
and the, our goal is to compute the coordinates of x with respect to f. That, that is, we want to find the uh, coefficients c1, c2 up to cn for the linear combination. To obtain the uh, to obtain the co coordinates, we often need to so solve linear equations, which is very time consuming. And uh, we know that for a given vector space v, there are infinitely many bases for v. How can we choose this? How can we choose a basis to speed up the computation of the coordinates? In this section, we show that if if the ba if different elements in a basis are orthogonal to each other, then the computation would become very easy. We we only need to compute inner products rather than solving linear equations. And uh, and uh, computing inner products is much faster than solving linear equations. Next, we define what is an orthogonal set. Let the set of v1, v2 up to vn be non-zero vectors in an inner product space V. If the inner product of vi and vj equals zero whenever i is not equal to j, then we say uh, the, the set v1, v2 up to vn is an orthogonal set. In, exa in example one, the set is an orthogonal set because different vectors in the set are orthogonal to each other. Next, we define what is an orthonormal set. An orthonormal set is an orthogonal set of uni vectors. That is, in addition to uh, be orthogonal to each other, each element in an orthonormal set uh, also need to satisfy the constraint. The length of the element uh, equals to 1. And uh, we know that the set u1, u2 up to un will be also normal if and only if the inner product of u, uh, ui and uj equals delta ij, where del delta ij equals 1 if i equals j, and uh, delta ij equals 0 if i is not equal to j. Given any orthogonal set of non-zero vectors, we can always transform the orthogonal set into an orthonormal set by defining uh, ui equals vi divided by the norm of vi. That is, uh, given, a, given any orthogonal set, then we uh, we let the length of each ve vector to be 1, then we can obtain an orthonormal set. We know that in working with an inner product space V, we often wish to have a basis of mutually orthogonal unit vectors. Because such, ve such basis is not only convenient, in finding coordinates of vectors, but also convenient for solving least squares problems, which will be shown in later sections. Next, we introduce theorem 5.5.1. Uh, if the set v1, v2 up to vn is an orthogonal set of non-zero vectors in an inner product space V, then v1, v2 up to vn are linearly independent. Theorem 5.5.1 uh, states that uh, orthogonality is a stronger condition than linear independence because orthogonality implies linear independence. To prove this fact, uh, we consider the equation c1, v1 plus c2, v2 plus up to cn vn equals the zero vector. If we can show the only solution to this equation is the 
trivial solution c1 c2 up to cn all equal zero then we can say v1 v2 up to vn are linearly independent to this end we take the inner product of vj and, uh, with and uh, this equation and obtain c1 times the inner product of vj and the v1 plus c2 times the inner product of vj and the v2 plus up to cn times the inner product of vj and the vn equals zero this equality holds for j uh, from 1 2 up to n and uh, we know that because v1 v2 up to vn are mutually orthogonal and therefore vi the inner product of vi and vj equals zero if i is not equal to j hence we have the following uh, equality cj times the square of the norm of vj equals zero uh, for j from 1 to up to n and uh, we know that because vj uh, is non-zero and therefore the norm of vj is greater than zero for j from 1 to up to n and therefore we can conclude c1 c2 up to cn uh, must be all equal to zero and therefore uh, we have proved the linearly uh, we have proved the the set v1 v2 up to vn are linearly independent in example 3 we illustrate how to find an orthonormal set for the inner product space of continuous functions and consider the inner product space of continuous functions defined on the interval from negative pi to pi with the inner product defined as uh, the inverse of pi times the integration of, of fx times g of x from negative pi to pi and we know that the set uh, 1 cosine x cosine 2x up to cosine nx is an orthogonal set because the because the inter, because the inner product of 1 and the cosine x equals 0 for k from 1 to up to n and uh, uh, this is true because the integration of cosine kx times 1 uh, from negative pi to pi uh, equals 0 uh, we also know that the inner product of cosine jx and the cosine kx equals the integration of cosine jx times cosine kx from negative pi to pi which also equals 0 if j is not equal to k and uh, therefore the elements in in the set uh, 1 cosine x up to cosine nx are orthogonal to each other and uh, we also know, know that the functions cosine x cosine 2x up to cosine nx are, or, are already unit vectors uh, because the inner product of cosine kx and uh, itself uh, equals 1 and therefore the length of cosine kx equals 1 and so uh, cosine x are, uh, are unit vectors and uh, to form an orthonormal set we only need to find a unit vector in the direction of 1 to this end we compute uh, the, the length of 1 uh, that is we compute the inner product of, of 1 and uh, itself which equals 2 and therefore 1 divided by the norm of 1 which equals uh, the inverse of the square root of 2 is a unit vector and hence we have find uh, the inverse of the square root of 2 uh, cosine x cosine 2x up to cosine nx 
is an orthonormal or set for the uh, inner product space. Let B be the set of U1, U2 up to UK. Suppose B is an orthonormal set in an inner product space V. Then B is a basis for the subspace S, which is spanned by U1, U2 up to UK. We say B is an orthonormal basis for S. Next, we introduce theorem 5.5.2. Let U1, U2 up to UN be an orthonormal basis for an inner product space V. And uh, if the vector V is a linear combination of U1, U2 up to UN, then the coefficient CI is the inner product of V and uh, UI. To prove this fact, we compute uh, the inner product of V and uh, UI which equals the inner product of uh, the summation of CJ, UJ, and uh, UI. We know that the summation can be taken outside the inner product uh, due to the pro properties in the definition of inner product. And uh, now we have uh, the summation of CJ times the inner product of UJ and uh, UI. And uh, know that the inner product of UJ and the UI is delta JI. And uh, delta JI equals 1 if J equals, two, equals I. And uh, delta JI equals 0 if J is not equal to I. And uh, hence, uh, summation CJ delta JI equals CI and uh, the proof is finished. We can use a simple example to illustrate theorem uh, 5.5.2. Consider the uh, figure uh, in the uh, in the bottom of this slide and uh, we consider V be R2 and uh, suppose and the E1, E2 is the standard basis in R2. And we let U1 be E1 and uh, let U2 be E2. And uh, suppose V is the vector of 2, 1 transpose. Then V can be expressed as a linear combination of E1 and uh, E2. And uh, the coefficients 2 uh, is obtained by taking the pro inner product of V and uh, E1. And uh, the coefficient 1 is obtained by taking the inner product of V and uh, E2. Next, we introduce corollary 5.5.3. Let U1, U2 up to UN be an also normal basis for an inner product space V. If U is a linear combination of U1, U2 up to UN, uh, where A1, A2 up to AN are the coefficients. And the V is a linear combination of U1, U2 up to UN, and where the coefficients are B1, B2 up to BN, then the inner product of V and U equals the summation of a i b i for i from 1 up to n we know that uh, we know that the coordinate of u with respect to the also normal basis is a1 a2 up to a n and uh, the coordinate of v with respect to the also normal basis is b1 b2 up to b n and uh, the inner product of V and U equals the scalar product of uh, the coordinate of U and uh, the coordinate of V. To prove uh, this corollary, we compute the inner product of U and V, which equals the inner product of the summation of AI, UI, and uh, V. 
the summation can be taken outside the inner product uh, due to properties in the definition of inner product. Then we have a summation AI times the inner product of UI and uh, V. Then we know that the inner product of V and the UI equals BI, uh, which is a result of theorem 5.5.2. And therefore, we have uh, summation AI uh, BI and uh, the proof of corollary 5.5.3 is finished. Next, we introduce corollary 5.5.4, which is the well-known possible formula. Let u1, u2 up to un be an orthonormal basis for an inner product space V. If V is a linear combination of u1, u2 up to un, where c1 where ci is the coefficient. Then the square of the norm of v equals the summation of ci squared. And to prove this fact, we compute the square of the norm of v, which is the inner product of v and uh, itself. Then by corollary 5.5.3, we know the inner product of V and itself equals the summation of CI square, and uh, the proof is finished. Next, we discuss uh, example 4. Let uh, E be the set of U1 and U2, and where U1 and U2 are given vectors in R2. We know that E is an orthonormal basis for R2. And uh, let X be a given vector in R2. And uh, our goal is to express X as a linear combination of U1 and uh, U2. Or equivalently, our goal is to compute the coordinate of X with respect to E. Then from theorem 5.5.2, we know the coefficient c1 uh, equals the inner product of x and the u1, and uh, the coefficient c2 equals the inner product of x and the u2. After we have computed c1 and c2, then x equals c1 u1 plus c2 u2. And uh, from corollary 5.5.4, the possible formula, we also have the square of the norm of x equals the inner product of x and itself, uh, and uh, which is equal to c1 square plus c2 square. Next, we discuss example 5. Let E be the set of U1 and U2, where U1 equals the inverse of the square root of 2, and the U2 equals cosine 2x. From example 3, we know uh, U1 and U2 forms an orthonormal set in the inner product space of continuous functions defined on the interval from negative pi to pi. And our goal is to compute the integration of the fourth power of sine x from negative pi to pi without computing antiderivatives. To this end, know that the integration of the fourth power of sine x from negative pi to pi equals pi times the inner product of uh, sine the square of sine x and uh, itself. If we denote the square of sine x as x, then our goal is to compute pi times the inner product of x and uh, itself. If we can express x as a linear combination of u1 and u2, then we can use the possible formula to uh, compute the inner product of x and uh, itself. To do this, we know that the square of sine x 
equals uh, the parentheses of 1 plus cosine 2x divided by 2 and hence uh, we know x we know c1 equals the inverse of the square root of 2 and c2 equals 1 half and therefore uh, in view of the possible formula the inner product of x and itself equals c1 squared plus c2 squared and hence the integration of the fourth power of sine x from negative pi to pi equals uh, 3 fourths times pi next we discuss exercise 5 uh, let u1 and u2 form an also normal basis for r2 and the u is a unit vector in r2 if u transpose u1 equals 1 half determine the value of the absolute value of u transpose u2 uh, first we ex express u as a linear combination of u1 and u2 uh, that is u equals c1 u1 plus c2 u2 from the condition uh, u transpose u1 equals 1 half we know c1 equals 1 half and uh, because u is a unit vector we have u transpose u equals 1 which equals uh, c1 square plus c2 square and therefore we know the absolute value of c2 equals uh, the square root of 3 divided by 2 and uh, the absolute value of c2 equals the absolute value of u transpose u2 which is what we want to compute next we discuss exercise 7 let, you, let the set u1, u2, u3 be an orthonormal basis for an inner product space V and suppose x equals c1 u1 plus c2 u2 plus c3 u3 uh, is a vector with the following properties the norm of x equals 5 the inner product of u1 and x equals 4 and uh, x is orthogonal to u2 uh, what are the possible values of c1, c2 and c3 the condition the norm of x equals 5 implies that uh, the square root of the inner product of x and itself equals 5 and hence the square root of uh, c1 square plus c2 square plus c3 square equals 5 and uh, the condition the inner product of u1 and x equals 4 implies that c1 equals 4 and uh, the condition x is orthogonal to u2 implies that uh, c2 uh, equals 0 and hence we know uh, the square of c3 equals 25 minus c1 square minus c2 square which is 9 and therefore c3 equals 3 or negative 3 next we discuss exercise 9 suppose s is the set of uh, the inverse of the square root of 2 cosine x cosine 2x cosine 3x and uh, cosine 4x and uh, from example 3 we know that s is an orthonormal set in the uh, inner product space of continuous functions uh, defined on the interval from negative pi to pi uh, sub question a s us to express the fourth power of sine x as a linear combination of the elements of s and uh, if we denote s as u1 u2 up to u5 then our goal is to compute c1 c2 up to c5 such that the fourth power of sine x equals c1 u1 plus c2 u2 plus up to c5 u5 to this end we know that 
the square of sine x equals the parentheses of 1 minus cosine 2x divided by 2. And therefore, the force power of sine x equals the square of parentheses uh, 1 minus cosine 2x divided by 2. After some computations, we obtain the coefficients c1, c2 up to c5. And uh, sub question b uh, asks us to compute two integrals. The first integral is the integration of the fourth power of sine x time times cosine 3x uh, from negative pi to pi, which is equal to pi times the inner product of the fourth power of x times uh, the fourth is equal to pi times the inner product of the fourth power of sine x and the u4. And we know that this inner product equals c4. And since c4 is 0, and hence uh, the integral is 0. Uh, next, we compute the integration of the fourth power of sine x times cosine 4x from negative pi to pi, which is equal to pi times the inner product of the fourth power of sine x and the u5. We know that the inner product equals c5, and the c5 is uh, 1s, and therefore the integral equals uh, pi, time, pi divided by 8. We have finished section 5.3, and uh, we have covered some of the main results in section 5.5. And uh, we will finish section 5.5 .5 in the next week. In this slide, I selected some exercises for you to practice. You can use the selected exercises to test whether you understand the course contents. After learning section 5.3, you should understand the geometrical insights behind the normal equations. Uh, which is the orthogonal projection. And uh, you should be familiar with the definitions of orthogonal sets and uh, orthonormal sets. Uh, you should understand uh, their geometrical meaning as well as uh, how to uh, and uh, their benefits for computing the coordinate vectors. Feel free to leave comments regarding this video or the slides.